Our next reader was born in Brooklyn, New York, and now resides in the Chicago suburbs. She has worked for Essence Communications as a photo editor, the Harlem Children's Zone as the managing editor of Harlem Overheard, StoryCorps as a facilitator coordinator, and Goldman Sachs as a long-term administrative temp slash secret eth ethnographer. Tracy is a graduate of Clarion West and proud alum of Columbia University School of General Studies majoring in anthropology. She is currently reworking a NaNoWriMo project into a novel and a screenplay because she is a masochist. Give a warm welcome to Tracy Harper Porter. everyone, thank you so much for coming, and I'm, I'm just, I feel like I'm amongst giants. I'm really enjoying the reading so far. Um, this is an excerpt from a working project that you'd mentioned called Invisible Hands, a, a story about two sisters on a, a gap year adventure in a zombie-ish post-apocalyptic world. Uh, last time I was here last year, um, I read an excerpt featuring the younger sister, Iris, Today, I'll be reading a bit featuring both of them, but mainly her older sister, Ayo. Um, and uh, just to give you a little background, um, uh, Iris and Ayo uh, James are the daughters of Celestine James. Um, and they are in a caravan currently um, with uh, two others that you will uh, hear about. Notes found in the journals of Celestine James, ne Jean-Pierre. Burn my body when I'm gone. I don't own my own autopsy. The dead have no rights, so I must assert myself now, like incorporating your uterus before flowering. My profile is in the cloud. Scorch the nerves of information so I cannot be uploaded into a machine. I am imperfect with a short time here. I am old and at the end of life. When I go, no one remember me. No one let me drag you down fly away, leave the miasma behind, the cloud collection of half-curated memories. I am a flaw, refracting cultural consciousness, and a cruel one at that. Without question, I accepted I couldn't live a pain-free life. I will be judged harshly, so would rather be forgotten, and hope that there was some nameless good I did. I am. Sometimes it is better to burn, the body without anima is a sack of meat and gravity and rot draws down familiar features. Living warmth is an unconscious stirring of the hairs on your body, a circulation of air that is more free flowing. There is less air around the dead, only a suggestion of heat under the surface as microorganisms use the materials to build their paradise. The meat is always useful for the churn of life. I've seen the ways people embarrass themselves on the small stage of grief. If there is no corpse, there is nothing to throw yourself against, nothing to weep over, no cold hand to grasp, no illusion that they are still with you. But with burning, there is an opportunity cost. What else you've got? Mr. Cervantes is fat, not grossly fat, pleasantly fat, the kind of fat that you get when you have extra butter to put on rolls and eat meat more often than once a week. He had a thin mustache above a delicate Cupid's bow and a fleshy lower lip. The girls had offered everything they had to Mr. Cervantes, the Walmart innkeeper. New cheat codes for the combiners, medical procedures and technical manuals for the local ancient med pods, even some high-end supplies that were very hard to come by these days they had hoped to keep themselves like the anticoagulant gels their mother had once spent a fortune on. He just didn't seem interested. Actually, he appeared agitated for some reason constantly with his ear on the comm system he kept below his worn melamine counter. On top of the counter was a shotgun that looked like it was well cared for and used frequently. Through the chatter, a voice came through the comm. Northeast sector clear boss, no sign of Mr. Cervantes quickly reached below the counter and muted the receiver while smiling grimly at the pair. Apologies. We've been handling a herd stock issue and it's taken up much of my morning. Today is not a good day for barter. I'll set you up on our lot for the night and perhaps I can make some inquiries for you in the morning. Do they need help, Iris said. I'm excellent at herding. My sister is eager but inexperienced. Io pushed Iris firmly behind her. Well, honestly, if you want business today and you're really in a hurry, that's the easiest job you're gonna get. Iris is not yet the age of consent, Io said. 
On the contrary, due to overruns, the age of consent has been temporarily lowered to 12 and one half years. Everyone has a use, Miss Jones, everyone. Should I be concerned, Mr. Cervantes? Io's voice was quiet, but her gaze was stony. Not at all. We are civilized and stable, just a bit of an uptick. Conscription is only for criminals in the region. Thank you for your advice and the lot slip offer. We'll be on our way to set up and I will see you first thing in the morning for barter only. Mr. Cervantes nodded in a show of gallantry. Of course, Ms. Jones, I will make inquiries this evening. I am certain we can find a way to mutually benefit. He reached behind him to the wall of slip keys and selected a receiver labeled slip 83. He slid it across his scratch desk to Io. Well lit, close to food stalls, showers, and laundry facilities. Wouldn't want you girls to feel unsafe in any way. He smiles. His teeth are yellow but beautifully straight. Old enough to have veneers or braces before the fall, Io thought. She hesitated for a moment. Are the adjacent slips open as well, Io said. I'd like to stretch out. Of course. The first night in the Walmart parking lot was fun and games, what I hoped she could create for Iris every night they were on the road. While Io set up for the evening, Navia brought Iris around to the other slips on the Walmart lot and handed out flyers advertising her bodywork services. She was lucky and found and invited an older couple from a rather impressive dreamliner on slip nine, Gerald and Samantha Powers, to suffer. Gerald had high blood pressure and Samantha suffered from arthritis and Navia hoped to take them on as clients. That evening, Io played chopped against Samuel with forage greens, fresh caught fish, and replenished pantry supplies from town. And after eating and declaring Samuel the winner, they and their guests sat around the fire pit and Navia played her guitar. And Samuel sang robust and rivaled flirty songs of which he improvised. Iris of the rainbow eyes, Io, moon goddess too beautiful and far away and cold and severe that made the others laugh and little Irish blush. Io took out a small stereo set that carried sound surprisingly well in the still air and played hours of her mother's old playlists, which drew other slip inhabitants to the perimeter of their small camp and eventually evolved into a late night dance party. At one point, Io stood on top of her van, out across the group of 40 plus people sweating it out and saw Iris twirling and laughing with Samantha to salt and peppers push it and thought, how long can I keep this going? The next morning, while Navia set up her outdoor clinic and Samuel went to find extra tires, Io and Iris headed into the main drag of the small town after Mr. Cervantes begged off another day for inquiries. The bar Mr. Cervantes recommended for lunch, a rustic log jammed three-story structure, was mostly empty with the exception of two small parties, about three each, satelliting themselves on the opposite ends of the room, and the bartender, a short, merry-faced woman with bright red hair and a pretty gap between her teeth. Her dreads reached her thighs and were elegantly held back from her face with a large multicolored cloth wrapped pin. She looked at the entering girls and whistled low. Aren't you a sight? Hello and welcome visitors. I'm Maven and this is my tavern. Maven's tavern, Iris asked. It sticks in your mind. What would you like? Some coffee, black, water, tap, orange juice for her, no ice, Iris said. You got it. I didn't get a chance to order Iris, Iris wine. We aren't eating anything here, Iris. Io scanned the tables and found a booth that was equidistant to the two occupied tables. She strode to the booth, Iris scrambling after her. Come on, I'm starving, let's order. I Io held her hand up. I'm testing this facility. For what? Gradient elevations? You're a surveyor. Yes, and I think it's about time you get hit to what that actually means, Iris. I survey, I look at the lay of all the landscapes. Didn't you guys talk about this at school? I know that a small portion of your job may be node exchange and information assessment, but isn't testing for contagion and poison levels at a local bar a little granular? Big picture thinking is what got us here in the first place. I heard a rumor and I'm testing that rumor. Io pulled out a small testing kit out of her backpack. Iris's eyes widened when she saw the glint of Io's taser and pistol in the sack. Maven returned with the drinks. She eyed the testing equipment and sighed. I suppose it wouldn't matter if I got you better drinks on the house. I have an, she thinks furiously, unopened Gewürztraminer, very floral. She looked nervously <laughs> over at the other tables. Nope. Io placed the white test strip in each vessel. All three quickly transformed into a glowing red. I can explain, surveyor, just Iris will do. And yes, please explain. 
Please explain why not only are these drinks doped, but they also, she checked her smartwatch, have unusual amounts of radioactive particulate. Maven's eyes widened. The first may not have anything to do with you. Io looked over at the table nearest the kitchen where the two of the three men were leering at them. The second is all your fault. Perhaps I can interest you in our rooms upstairs. Maven's voice went up an octave in her pleading. Yes, I'd like a room. You can bring our drinks upstairs. Io said it loudly enough for the entire room to hear, then laid an arm across Iris's shoulders. An hour will do. Maven loaded the drinks back onto the tray and led them up the stairs that ended in a hallway of doors, each door decorated with a picture of a different flower. Maven quickly led them to the room on the right at the top of the stairs, painted over by a huge yellow tulip. Inside was a small but prettily appointed room with a queen-sized bed, a tiny desk, under a smaller window, and two upholstered wingback chairs surrounding an electric fireplace. Within the room, another door lay to their left with the words refresh and sanitize written on the door in a cursive script. Who are the two assholes downstairs, I have said. Maven immediately burst into tears. Jonas Welk and Tommy G, they work for Mr. Cervantes at the Walmart where you're parked. They've been waiting for you. They took my boy Aaron and I have to give the drinks to you. And now that they see you come up here, I don't know what they're gonna do. The last word elongated into a primal howl. This is what you're gonna do, Io said. You're gonna go downstairs and say we've been dosed. I also want a steak dinner and a whiskey, but to go, medium rare and neat. And both clean, of course. She smiled a narrow smile. This door connects to another room. I walked over and opened the refresh and sanitized door. There was a small sink and mirror set up and another door opposite with a large picture of a rose painted on it. Yes, Maven said, it's a connecting sink room for our ladies to share. Then tell them we're in, what's the next door? The rose room. Tell them we're in the rose room. Tell them we've already fallen asleep. Then get your boy and pretend you know nothing. I'm taking both rooms. Iris, you stay in this room and don't unlock it for anybody else but me. Not even gorgeous Maven here. You got it? Her voice was now as thin and sharp as steel. Almost involuntarily, Iris breathed her yes. Maven, is there another exit in this charming establishment? Yes, at the end of the hall, there's a fire exit that leads to the back of the building. Aya reached into her back pocket and threw her keys to Maven, who fumbled and caught them. Ayo keyed into her smartwatch. Maven, I've just paid for these rooms for a week along with some additional insurance. Will that be enough for you to drive my van to the back of the building? Will that be enough? Maven looked at her own smartwatch on her wrist and her eyes widened. This, this is too much. It may not be enough, dear, but if it is, isn't, I will pay what is owed. Okay, Ayo said with a feral grin. Let's play. Later, Ayo made Iris help her carry and burn the bodies in a large field outside the town. Then Ayo ate the steak and gave Iris the whiskey. Their camp was different than the first night after the tavern incident. Everyone quietly unpacked their supplies and ate improvised MREs. No one was interested in playing the chop game that night. Navia, quietly furious, packed up her supplies and stripped the white medical tent. They were moving on before dawn. <clears throat> in the silence, broken occasionally by the crackling fire, the group brooded. Iris finally broke the silence. Can you tell me why you did what you did? Iris asked. She didn't look at her sister as she asked the question. It was clear through the tears that shone in her eyes that she couldn't. Ayo said, you may not remember, but mother sang to us constantly. She had a contralto voice, cracked permanently by a years long smoking habit. She sang along with the top 100 on the car radio, crone, crooned soul, soulful songs, belted out 90s grunge era rock. All this, all this was the soundtrack of our childhood. Occasionally, she would guiltily pull out some Zouk music or classical, almost forcing us to eat our vegetables, but her soul got caught up long ago in a foundational R&B and hip hop melody that formed the scaffold of her musical appreciation. What our mother did every day, she sang to us. She told us she loved us. She danced freely. She was inquisitive. She encouraged confidence on the verge of insolence. She saw everything she did as a refutation of whatever forces made her feel small in her own history. Io paused and grinned grimly. She was also wildly inconsistent and struggled with self-discipline. Once father died, the Rehabilitation and Education Center eventually provided a structure she could not create on her own. She was conscientious in her own way, but got lost in the details. Before the center, there were days that I did homework in the candlelight while you slept, times when I had to forage for the three of us, times when I had to make hard choices. Once, father, once father's post-mortem AI was complete, 
He gave her the structure she needed to raise you properly, Iris. They co-parented together, AI father and her, raising you to become a fully formed citizen in this new world. He kept her steady, tracked her medications and moods, checked her when she began to spiral, and raised you alone when she couldn't get out of bed. But overall, she was in everyone's estimation, a better mother with you than I, even though she stopped singing. The mother you had was not the mother I had, Io concluded. I am so sorry, Iris said. I feel sorry for you, Io replied. Suddenly, the group was startled by the racking of a shotgun. Out of the shadows of the lot, Mr. Cervantes strolled into the light of their fire pit, holding his shotgun and accompanied by a posse of a dozen men. I think I'm about to make a citizen's arrest, Mr. Cervantes said. His yellow teeth flashed in the firelight. Thanks.